welcome back to Crazy Effing Mommy. I'm your host, Elise DeLucci. And this is episode 117. Oh my God, why is my microphone just falling off my desk? You know what? I got this microphone clamped onto my desk, you know, in like my little living room studio. And um, my daughters, they just think all this stuff is a toy. I can't stand it. Anyway, okay. Fact of the day, people. Did you know that more than 70% of the oranges in the country come from Florida? Yep, true. And also about Florida, 23 million years ago, which I don't know what um, period that was, uh, but it was underwater. I'm giving you these facts because obviously of the devastation in Florida. I met up with my girlfriend, Lindsay Logue. Hi, Lindsay. I know she listens to this podcast. She listens while she's running. She's amazing. She actually was a, uh, a news anchor down there, but her family lives in the Fort Myers area. They live in Tampa and uh, a few Englewood and a few other areas. And um, her in-laws are currently in the hospital. Her in-laws are amazing people. Her parents and her her in-laws are both great people, but the in-laws are, uh, I think they're like in there, I don't know, their 70s or something. And when the storm hit, they wanted to go save their, their, their in-laws, get it? So like her in-laws wanted to save their in-laws. So they wanted to go save like very elderly people, which is heroic, right? So they drove into the storm. They drove like from their house, but back like kind of towards the storm. And they were on, I think she said it was 75, Route 75, and their car flipped over and they were taken to the hospital. By the way, the car, Kia Telluride. I see that car all over the city and it's a gorgeous car. I really can't, kind of can't get over Kia because every time I think of Kia, I think of the Sportage, you know, and I'm just like, ick. But Kia is designed through the roof these days. I mean, they look great. I see them on the street and I'm like, oh, is that a Benz? And I'm like, wait, it's a Kia. But the car flipped over and the airbags didn't deploy. Can you imagine? Anyway, these poor people, somebody saw this happen on the, the road, got, you know, pulled them, got them into the hospital. They didn't even know. They didn't even know that their airbags didn't deploy. I think they knew that their car flipped, but it was if it wasn't for this person, I think that saved them, um, then went back and took pictures of the car. They would have had no idea. I said that lawsuit. Okay, lawsuit. I, I'm not a litigious person, but that's a lawsuit, right? I mean, anyway, they they, they thought. I think they. I think. Well, I thought. I think. I thought. I think. This is this is a little crazy, right? <laughs> when that happens. They thought they were fine once they were in the hospital because there was no visible damage to them, you know, that no cuts and scrapes. But the father, uh, Lindsay's father-in-law started complaining about internal bleeding and uh, and he did. So prayers to them. Lindsay and I, we celebrate our birthday every year. We have dinner, which is ridiculous because like the dinner that we have, I, this happens, right? To us as we get older, it feels like we just saw our friends yesterday, but meanwhile, it was a year ago. Like the dinner we had last year, it literally felt like a couple months ago. And my birthday's at the end of September, as is hers. And she's like, our dinner is coming. And I'm like, what? Anyway, we went to the Soho house down in the meatpacking district. We had a great time. We just had like, you know, like light apps kind of thing. She had everything, you know, because who wants to be bothered with entrees and and this and that. And we've known each other forever. So, you know, we, we weren't really like super hungry, you know, but they have like the most amazing it's like a fried chicken, but it's vegan. You know, it's cauliflower and it's so good. Like the sauce is good. Anyway, so we went there. It was really great. We had some drinks, had some had some hors d'oeuvres. And then we we just walked. I was doing a show in Midtown that wound up being canceled. And, and it was just one of those New York nights, like my favorite kind of nights, which by the way, my boyfriend doesn't like to do, which makes me want to kill him. Like we, we the plan... The magic of New York is that you plan to do something and then it doesn't work out. And then you just wander around and get lost in the city streets, right? And whether it's day or night, that's the magic. And I've been doing that since I'm literally a little girl. I would be going to my grandmother's house on Sunday for dinner in Greenwich Village. And after the macaroni and bacala was on the table, you know, and everybody ate, I would be like, mom, going to walk down to Canal Street. My family would be like, get out, going past Canal, it's terrible down there. I would just wander around. I had nowhere to go. I had nowhere to go. But anyway, 
So Lindsay and I, we we walked around uh, after the, the show didn't work out. And by the way, if you're watching this on video, it's a slightly distracting. I apologize. Uh, the 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 ring light, I see it coming up in my eyeglasses glare. <clears throat> More on that in a sec. Uh, but um, we walked through Times Square on Pit of Manhattan. But it was just, it was like magical. And it was Yom Kippur, so there wasn't a lot of people out. And uh, so Times Square, you could breathe. And even though the city's in such disarray and, and there's crime all over the place, it was fun. And we just sort of wandered around and we talked. And I think she like smoked a few cigarettes and I did not, although wanted to, but you know, I don't smoke well anymore. And that was a phase. I, I, what, am I, what do you want me to do? Yeah, what do you want me to do? It was the Jersey Shore. It was the Hamptons. Everybody was doing it. But anyway, and it was just fun. It was just fun. <clears throat> One of those great nights. So I'm wearing, I've been wearing glasses for the last like week or two because I went to the eye doctor and my prescription, they wanted to give me transitional lenses. Was it, is it transitional? Oh, progressives. And it's like, what am I, Sophia Perillo from the Golden Girls? Like, nah, I don't want those lenses. Like, but that, I, you know, this happens as you get older. Anyway, so my doctor tried something else, which is to lower. I'm really nearsighted, right? So I always wear contacts and glasses because I can't see far away. But he lowered my prescription for far away. And so my prescription has changed. So I don't have the progressives, but I have this new prescription and my glasses and contacts. So I've been wearing my glasses just to get my eyes used to things, you know? And, and I love it. I love wearing eyeglasses. I, oh, I collect eyeglasses. I mean, I collect a lot of things, but I always felt like they were jewels for the face. And by the way, there's a woman. Oh my God, what the hell is her name? What? Oh, Jesus Christ. Ugh, I can't remember. I probably talked about her before, but there was this woman when I worked at fashionista.com. I was one of the websites that was part of a small startup publisher a thousand years ago that I was on the founding team of. And our office was in Nolita downstairs uh, below. Uh, it was downstairs Moby's apartment, Moby, the electronica artist. Anyway, there was this woman, ah, Linda Directa. That's her name. Linda Directa. She had this little tiny store on Mott Street. I think it was Mott and Spring. And I forget the name of her store, but she <clears throat> is like a fabulous older woman, like just beyond. And she was always dressed in the most fabulous, like cashmere knit jumpsuits. And like, you know, one of these women with the, the pashmina, like the real one, not the $5 one from the street, you know, just like, thrown across her shoulders. And she always had these beautiful eyeglasses and she sold all these gorgeous jewels for the face type of eyeglasses. And I would go in there sometimes and I would buy from her, you know, they would be like these vintage French. I bought one pair of vintage French eyeglasses, electric blue from the 1960s. And I would take them to my eye doctor and I would get them with the lenses in them. And I have still uh, some of the glass. Oh, I have a, well, I have a wall, uh, except for like one of the glasses that I bought from her. I think I probably bought like nine pairs in the, in the four or five years I worked down there, but you know what? Jewels for the face. So I'm not so disappointed that I I'm wearing my glasses all around, but I, I you know, it's a, it's, it's an adjustment. So right now I have on my leopard cat eyes. These, these are, these are new. And, um, I don't really wear glasses on stage. My boyfriend tells me, Chris says I should, he's like, why don't you wear glasses on stage? He's like, you're cute. Like, you're, they're re you're real glasses. Like, you, you're super smart. Like, we just wear them on stage. See, it's not that I don't, I don't know. Give me, you could, if, you, if you think, if you have an opinion on that, shoot me a DM. I don't, I don't know. I, for some reason, I don't know if you feel like this. When I have my eyeglasses on, I feel like they, they like cover my face. Like, they, it's almost like they're protecting my face. And for stand up, I, I I, I'm present. I'm very like, need to be there, like focused in your face nothing blocking me in the audience. I kind of feel like the glasses block. Is that crazy? I don't know. Um, I, oh my God. I, I, I am just so done with like the family drama, just in general, like, right? Can we all agree on that? Can we all agree? So, you know, I have a book coming out, by the way, in Q1, 2023. And it's called Everything I Learned from the Mafia I Used to Succeed on Wall Street. And the book is uh, currently being published. So I'm okay to talk about it. And I'm so excited about it. But the book is uh, sort of about, it's like the rules of the mob. 
right? It's about the rules of the mob. And by the way, they mentioned this in a New York Post article I had a couple of weeks ago. So I feel, again, the more the reason why I feel okay. But the, the, the book is like the rules of the mob, which also could be like um, rules of Italian-American families, like pretty typical rules, you know, like people at work are not your friends, like keep to yourself, like those, you know, keep, keep silent, like those kind of things, right? And and the, the book is that, and then it's 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 what I learned, those rules that I learned growing up. And then how I, how I use them in my personal life, but but how I then use them to apply uh, in, in the business world, and how I use them to get ahead, right? So it's like a non-traditional uh, business, you know, scrappy book slash memoir. And in the book, you'll, I'm obviously telling stories about my life, right? Not, 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 um, not, you know, everything's real, you know, not, not, whatever. Not every single story, saving that for my biography one day. <laughs> no, but not not every single story, but but it's just, it's a compilation of stories, right? And I think you're going to like it, but that's not the point. The point is, is that I am so tired of the family drama and you will read about uh, my father in this book, right? And my father died in 2017 and it was a devastating time for me because uh well not only did he die but my he was my father my father was estranged and it was not by choice and it's it's a whole long thing but my parents got divorced my parents were married for 20 years and i have two other sisters right so it's they have, they have three kids all from the same parents and when i was i had a totally normal childhood like totally normal like born in Brooklyn, lived in Brooklyn, then moved out to Staten Island. Like, just like, just totally, like, just great. I had a great childhood, right? My youngest sister, Gabrielle, she's like 15 years younger than me. She had a different childhood because by the, when she was, you know, 10, my parents were divorced. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, I had no normal childhood, but my parents, they got divorced um, when I was 17. And it was really abrupt, like really abrupt. for, 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 For being married for 20 years, it was just really strange. Um, and, my parents, they, they fought like, so like, like, like parents would fight, but not like, not, not enough where you would ever think like that they're going to split up. Fine. So the divorce was a disaster without going into details, just the, like, just on so many levels, such a disaster. And, uh, we had private investigators and uh, we had people like, uh, the bodyguard, Tony, the snake, who's now dead. And they like, there was, it was a lot. Okay. And it was a traumatic time. And uh, my father died in 2017. And I ran into him a few times around Manhattan when I've been living here. So I moved to the city, you know, like 21 or whatever. So I, uh, well, I should say like officially moved because I used to live with my aunt in Tribeca when I was in high school on the weekends. Don't ask. I, I, I could like, I could, I just, I couldn't deal with like regular. I was like, you want me to conform? What? You want me to go to like a football game like on the weekend like and what like be a cheerleader uh excuse me i rather hang out with drag queens in the east village thank you so I, like the, you know like that was anyway okay so i moved officially uh to the city you know like it was 2021 whatever it was and um i ran into him a few times because my father lived in greenwich village and uh he had a girlfriend that lived in the east village and but they lived together they were like, I don't know. They had like two like apartments that like they probably shouldn't have. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, like they had money, but they were paying sixty dollars a month in rent. Like, you know what I'm saying? Little, little, ah, uh, little. Uh. If you see me in person, I'm doing this, the push in the nose to the side. Okay, don't like that. Anyway, we're because we're 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 by the book around here in my life. Thank you. So he dropped dead, and it was devastating. And I wasn't able to see him. And you'll read about this in the book. But the other day. My mother, she calls me up or she tell, texts me and she tells me some bank account. Wait, I like, I can't. She put some bank account turns up with the, a, a little bit of money in it that was in his name. When I say a little bit of money, let me be clear. $900, okay? No, $900. Not 9000 not 900 $900. Now, there was a time in my life when I was making a lot of money, right? And uh, on Wall Street, and I nine hundred dollars sometimes felt like 
not a lot of money. Felt like $9 to me, right? There were times. We all gone through these times in our life, right? We go through these times where sometimes you're just feeling like you have a ton of money and like $900, you're like, yeah, $900, big FNC, right? These days, $900, that's a lot of money to me. That's a lot. Of, and you know what? At the end of the day, it doesn't, it's a lot of money, period, period. The, we could go through a list of all the things that you could buy for $900. You could, could go through all the things, all the shares that you could buy in VOO, the Vanguard S&P index fund, which by the way, is great. And you should look into that. Uh, you, you, we could, we could talk about that, but we're not. $900 is a lot of money. So, but my mother she finds this account and she wanted my father's death certificate, which I have to, to be able to like get the money. And I was like, you know, we had, I had a lot of stuff going on, like just with work, various works. And then seeing my friend in Florida and I, I hadn't been home, you know, um, I didn't uh, have a chance to get her the certificate like in 24 hour period that she was wanting it. And the the net net of the story is after 24 hours, she was, she just like kind of went on a tear for it. Like I, like I need this, like I need, like it was, it was like, it was, and I was like, I'm in like an office right now. Like I have no access to a safe to get you this document. Like, can you give me like 12 hours? Like it was crazy. And it started to make me think, is there more money than 900? It doesn't matter if there was more money. I, I don't even care. But in the beginning, I, this is how it happened in like a 48 hour period. In the beginning, she said that she was going to get, take the $900 and she was going to split it three ways, me and my sisters. Great. Get $300. Oh, how much did you inherit when your father died? You know how much? $300. That's how much. Like when I tell you I, I got jack shit, I actually lost money when my father died because I was, I had to hire an attorney and then I wind up dropping things because it wasn't even worth it. And the, and like I hear I'm saying at the beginning of the podcast, I'm not litigious. The reason why I had to hire an attorney was because my father wasn't married and, um, and I was the, uh, I on his oh sorry we had a little bit of a tech outage I'm back mid story that's the worst thing that could have ever happened anyway in the beginning of this 48 hour whirlwind my mother said she was going to take the nine hundred dollars and she was going to split it three ways between my me and my sister and it's like how much did you get for inheritance when your father died three hundred bucks great right like that's that's basically what um I'm talking about here and then you know I wasn't getting back to her because I was telling her I was at work blah, blah. and then. It's, 24 hours once goes by and she says to me, you know, something about, I need the death certificate to get the account because it's my money. And I was just like, what? Like, what, you know, like, what, 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 what even, I can't even begin to tell you how insane this whole thing was, right? Like, so, so I said to my mom, I am going to get you this death certificate so you can go retrieve this $900 like as soon as I get some time, I said, but I just want to be clear with you. Like you are divorced for you. You divorced my father. Like my father's not no longer around and that you guys got divorced when I was 17, like 22 years ago. Okay. And my sisters and I got zero inheritance. So anything, like I said to my mom, just saying anything that like we found, if, if something that came up, should go to me and my sisters, right? And she told me that I was terrible for saying that anything should go to us and it belongs to her because she was his wife and that's that. And you know what? Let me tell you something, people. My hair was on fire when I read this, okay? Because money is the root of all evil. And it, that, that's just it. It just is. Money is the root of all evil. I can't even believe that I'm sitting here talking to you, telling you the story about $900. And someone that had, that someone that was married to somebody for 20 years and had three children, okay? And they got, and, and my mother, she willingly got divorced and got remarried and has a whole nother life, right? And, 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 and a little sum, a tiny sum of money shows up in a bank account. And my mother says she feels entitled to, why don't you just, continue on the narrative that you saw it in the first 24 hours and give your daughters 300 measly shitty dollars and say, here's $300 each. He, he, here's, a, here's, here's some money for you when your father died. You know, happy inheritance day. It's like, it's so fucked up. It's so sick. I, I, and you know, and, and, the, the, and by the way, I would probably be even saying different things right now, like not bad or, you know, or better, but a stupid sound dropped out. What the hell? So anyway, I 
and to cut off my story. But it's like, I just can't stand the drama. I just can't stand it. So you know what? I, so now I'm pissed off. Now I'm pissed off. Now it's like I'm, I'm, I'm up to my eyeballs in work. I'm in an office. I, I have 10,000 things going on. My ex-husband just left for Argentina to go on a two-week fucking probably honeymoon with his girlfriend that I can't stand. Okay. And, uh, and, and, you know, and it's like, I'm on tour with, it's like, I have so many things going on and I'm working and I have my children and I'm cooking three meals a day and I'm doing laundry and I got to manage, you know, the, the, the babysitter nanny schedule, you know, it's like, and I'm not complaining. This is what life is. And out of the clear blue sky, just out of nowhere, you know, it's like, I need you to dig through your safe to find me a copy of this death certificate so I get $900 to give you and your sisters. And it's like, okay, I'll do it as soon as I can. And then it turns into, you know what? I want you to do this right now when I say immediately. And you know what? By the way, this money, it's mine because I deserve it because I had some terrible fucking, you know, marriage or divorce or whatever with this guy. And and how and you're terrible, Elise. You're terrible for saying that I, that it should go to you and your sisters. And it shouldn't go to me. And you know what I told my mother? You know what I said to her? I said, I said, you want to know what? I will get you that certificate when I have time. And you know what you could do? Take the money and you can keep it. I said, you keep it. I will give my two sisters $300 each. I'll give them $600 that I don't have. Okay. I'll give them $600. I don't have that I've allocated to go spend somewhere else. I'll go take it out of some account. I will give them $600 so they can get their little fucking shitty inheritance. Okay. And and we will move on. And I said to my mother, and I said, you make no mistake about it, that if I ever make the kind of money, you know, I used to make, right? Or if, I, if I'm ever at a point in my career where I'm just making, a, you know, a, a, a nice, handsome sum of money, if I ever hit it huge, if I, if you, listen, you are hearing it first, people, you are hearing it first right here. What, what's the date? Let's switch the date. It is Friday, October 7th, 2022. You are hearing this first. If you ever see Elise DeLucci on a Netflix special, if you ever see Elise DeLucci on an Amazon special and you read somewhere that I've gotten some large sum of money, let me tell you what I'm going to do with that money. I am going to take care of my two daughters, my ex-husband, and I am going to take care of my two sisters. And I told my mother, I will make money and uh, one day and I will take care of my sisters because it is sure as shit. Nobody else is thinking about us. Thank you. And, 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 you know, and of course she just like, she doesn't even bother to answer. Anyway, I was just, I'm so, I don't care. And then I told my other sister, Allison, my sister, she's four and a half years younger than me. I told her after the, 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 the talk, I said, you got to talk to mommy. Like, this is so, I don't know what's going on. I don't know if this is a control issue. I don't know why she's fighting about like why she's like, it's like, it's like, I'm not jumping when she's saying, go get me this document. You know, it's like, she's not understanding that, you know, uh, all the stuff that I have going on in my life. She's not understanding that I have a life. You know, it's like my sisters and I, we were treated so, we were treated really like really inhumane when um, my father died. And again, you'll read about a little bit about it in the book. I'm talking about like, like being called all kinds of names because we cared that he passed. And you know what? It was sick. It was, it was, it was sick and it was like fucked up. And it was part of the reason why I had like a real major nervous breakdown um, in uh, 2018, you know, cause I had, you know, I had two tiny babies at home. I had my father pass away and uh, I had a, a lot of stuff going on at work and, and, you know, and I was doing improv and stand up then, but like really like very, like just started like one year in, you know? So um, it was, it was, it was really, it, you know, and that stuff saved my life, like the stand up and the improv. Like it was, I was horrible one year in, one and a half years in. We're all horrible when we first thought, you know, like usually any art form, one, one, one year in. But I, um, I, it saved my life. And I can't deal with someone, my own flesh and blood, you know, just, with such being spoken to with such insensitivity about such a sensitive topic. And by the way, this was asked of me on my dad's birthday, um, which was October 2nd. And so that was even worse. That was just even worse. And um, the whole thing's fucked up. The whole thing's fucked up. Anyway, you'll, 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 you'll read about it. You'll not, not the $900, but you'll read about it, but it's like, can we stop the family drama? It's like, can we just like, it, like, and by the way, by the way, 
if people are crying about $900 or if that's a ton of money or whatever it is, maybe you shouldn't retire. How about that? Maybe you shouldn't retire from work. Just a thought, just a thought. And you know what? Let me tell you something. Let me tell you who doesn't give a fuck, me. I literally do not care. I don't care. I hope they don't listen to this. I'm sure they will. And I'm sure I will be persona non grata, like forever. But you want to know what? I'm not being a bitch. I'm, I'm saying everything that's normal. I'm saying everything that's normal. And this is my life. And I share my life. And that's what I do. And I'm disgusted over it. Okay. On a nice note, there is something that you people need to read that you, it's going to move you so much, especially if you're parents. Uh, listening to this. There was an article in the New York Times magazine that I read called, and the title of the article is called, I have it right here, Homeless Children, Homeless Children Students. I think that that doesn't even make sense. Is that really what it's called? Okay, that's what I have written down. Homeless Children Students. Just Google it. New York Times article. And also throw in Google Ohio. Okay, it's going to come up. There's an article in the New York Times Magazine from last week about a woman, right, who uh, she is from Ohio and she is her role, she has a job and she's not like the principal of the school or teacher. Her job is the homeless liaison in the school district. And this whole article talks about how there's a real homeless uh, student population in like the Midwest and specifically in Ohio. And, uh, you know, in this, in her school district and it, the whole article is about talking about what, how kids become homeless and how they deal with being homeless and a student and how they deal with, uh, being, how they deal with those kind of terrible things that, you know, they, you don't have a home, you don't have food to eat, you don't have clothes, you can't get washed for school. And we all know how horrible school kids and how many, you know, how, how bullies they could be, right? What bullies they could be. And it, and so it educates you on that. And then it talks about this woman who literally is doing the Lord's work. And I just have to say, her name is, hold on, I have it here. Her name is Sandra Plants, P-L-A-N-T-Z. I know she's never going to hear this. I know this podcast, Crazy Effing Mommy, is not going to reach Ohio uh, about this, this, this homeless liaison in the public schools in Ohio. But Sandra Plants, I had to tell you, you're never going to hear this. Oh, you're probably likely never. Gonna. I am in awe of you. And you are a role model because this woman, you have to read about her. She's an angel. First of all, she needs to have, they, they need to make a movie about this woman and what she does. She started to educate herself on how to identify homeless kids she was reading about like laws. She started taking webinars and conferences. She started sending home like intake forms to the parents. And then uh, she started training people that worked in the school to look like the bus drivers. So she would say, tell me, she would say to the bus drivers, if you're dropping off a student or picking them up, tell me if they're, they no longer go dr get dropped off or requesting to get dropped off at the same house. Tell me if the conditions of the house deteriorate, right? And, um, or, or she says to the nurse, tell me if you can't send a sick student home for the day because there's nowhere to go. And she put these procedures sort of in place. And the number of homeless people that she, students that she identified went from like three to four to 150 in this, the whole school district. And I don't, I don't know, um, I, I don't know how many kids are in the school district a, a, as a whole, but like 150 homeless students, I mean, whether it's one or 150,000, it doesn't really matter, but uh, it's horrifying. And so she created this room in the school and she, it's the, they call it the Raider room. I think the Raiders are like their mascot. And basically she puts all donations in the room and like, you know, like shirts and, you know, shoes and underwear and, you know, blow dryers. And there's like a shower in there and all this stuff. And, you know, she has kids volunteer like in the room, just like random kids in the school volunteer. And then she kind of like sends like decoys in, like of the, the, the homeless kids. She like sends like homeless decoys in to go then in the room and like take what they need or take a shower so they don't have to feel ashamed, you know, that they're, they're shopping and like, you know, sort of the, the Goodwill store in the school kind of thing. And uh, one girl, for example, like 
came to school a wreck. Like she was a cheerleader and she didn't want to come to school. Or she was stopped coming to school actually. No, she yeah, she stopped coming to school. She was a cheerleader because she had an unstable housing situation. She wasn't able to do her hair in the morning. So what did this Sandra Plants do? She got her pocketbook, went to Walgreens, bought a $14 straightener, and then told the girl, when you come into school, come straight to the Raider room, take a shower, strain your hair, and you know, you'll be good to go. And this woman, she started basically going into like the investigating like the homes and all this stuff. And I mean, just the things that you're going to read in this article are just heartbreaking. You know, um, like family sharing, emo- like two mo- single mothers with kids sharing a motel room and have, you know, like one breakfast sandwich between like five kids or another family that lives in a house, rents a house and the landlord won't fix the, uh, the the home and then the house becomes condemned and one of the little kids falls through the soft boards of the floor, through the floor, you know, and is stuck up to his waist because the floor is in such terrible condition. The house gets then officially condemned. They have to move out there on the street. Salvation Army puts this family in a motel for like $100 a week or something like this. And, but it's an hour from the school. And then the mother can't afford the gas to drive the kids to school. Like this, it's such a situation. I I just like, you know what? I want you to read about it because maybe there's something that someone that listens to this podcast, like maybe there's someone that can do something is basically what I'm saying. Like I don't have the power yet to do anything like for the situation. But if this is, this is rural America, but. I mean, I know that there are probably homeless children in the New York City public school system, right? I don't know. You know, I told Chris and he was like, well, what could we do? And I said, I don't know. I said, if I find out that there's a homeless student population somewhere or homeless children, hungry children will do an immediate comedy fundraiser. I mean, like, right? Like, I mean, every Jerry Seinfeld will come on and do it. Of course. We'll call Jerry up on the phone. I mean, he would, you know, everybody's going to do this. Is, this is crazy. But maybe there's somebody that knows something. And and I just couldn't, you know, and by the way, I read this article like also like around the days when I was with this $900 bullshit and it made me even more like sick and insane. But anyway, it's one of those things where it's like you read it and it's like you, you want to educate yourself, you want to know about it, but then you're like, the world is so unfair. But then you're like, you have to do something. I don't know. I, just, it's worth the read. It makes you, it made me so much more appreciative for what I have and my two daughters and our health and, you know, whatever little space we live in. And, you know, little Annalise, so sweet. My oldest daughter, eight years old, she's asking for her own room, you know? And like, she's like, mommy, I want my own room. I don't want to share a room with Vivi. And it's like, okay, first of all, you sleep in the same beds both like half the time, you know, they're, they're little, they want to like, you know, it's like, you want your own room. You don't even want to sleep in your own bed. You want to sleep bunk together like every night. But it's like, you know, she's so sweet asking for her own room all the time. But it's like, you know, and sometimes I I beat myself up. I'm like, I can't afford to buy a three bedroom apartment for my child, my my family in this insane city. Most people cannot, right? Uh, Obviously. And, um, but sometimes I feel really bad. I'm like, oh my God, am I doing a right, a good job? Like my kids don't have their own room. You know, my kids, you know, they, they share clothes or, you know, whatever. It's like, am I doing the, the good job? But then I read this and I'm like, you want to know what? You're doing just fucking fine. You're doing, we are all just doing fine, right? And um, so I, that that's why I think it's really worth the read. Uh, also people that are doing fine are, Leah Michelle in Funny Girl on Broadway, people, because the New York Times said in an article a couple weeks ago, looks like that Broadway finally found their Fanny Bryce. Okay, Michelle. Okay, Leah Michelle. It's like everybody doubted her, remember? I mean, you know, we were all over this story here on Crazy Effing Mommy because, I mean, first of all, I've been waiting for that show, you know, to come on Broadway since the 60s. I was up in heaven screaming down like, is somebody going to pr- uh, 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 revise? Wait, what is it? I don't even know what the word is. Is somebody going to bring back? Is it reprise? What's the word? Bring back. Funny girl on Broadway. Okay, who cares? <laughs> Funny girl on Broadway. <sighs> Beanie Feldstein didn't take it seriously. We knew this. We've been there, done that. We talked about it. We all rooted for her. We wanted her to win. Sorry, Beanie. You're out. Leah's in and she's freaking killing it. She's been waiting her whole life for this. Of course she is. 
Let me tell you something, okay? 15 years ago, Leah Michelle, she was sitting in her dressing room for Spring Awakening, and she was heartbroken over some guy, some stupid asshole, when a Broadway director came over to her, this is a true story, by the way, offered her a piece of advice and said, do yourself a favor. Go home, watch the movie Funny Girl with Barbara Streisand. And she did, and it changed her life. She did, and then she like went on some crazy-ass tear that she was like a Fanny Bryce, Barbara Streisand, insane sick fangirl like me and uh then she you know wound up auditioning in glee and you know obviously through glee her whole character in glee was obsessed with fanny rice and barbara and you know she would they would sing the songs and all this and um so obviously serendipity came god made this happen she's killing it on broadway and now i'm gonna get tickets again i saw it with beanie and i'm going back and it made me think is Leah Michelle going to like do such a great job over the years? Is the play going to run for a long time? Is the show going to run for a long time? And is she going to make her Broadway mark like Bernadette Peters, like Barbara, like Ethel Merman, right? Like Elaine Stritch. Oh, love Elaine Stritch. And by the way, if you haven't ever seen Elaine Stritch documentary, is it just, I think it's just shoot me. Please do yourself a favor and watch it. Watch the Lane Stritch documentary, and you, that's an insight into my personality. Oh, Patty Lapone, like is Leah Michelle going to join the ranks of of this cast of amazing Broadway legends? Right, that's what is Broadway legends. By the way, Lane Stritch, you know she lived in the Carlisle Hotel. She used to run around New York City without pants on. Oh God, you know she's dead, but she she's really she oh she's really something. Another old lady, oldish, Princess Anne, Queen Elizabeth's daughter. She was on the Staten Island Ferry last week. What the hell was she doing? Or two weeks ago, her mother died. And I don't know, she decided to take a maiden voyage to uh, a <laughs> maiden voyage on the Staten Island Ferry. Why? Who knows? Get herself a good slice. Yeah, I don't know. Apparently, she came to the US. She made a visit here and she just got on the ferry. Just, just got on the ferry. I don't turn on the linear television, which is like kind of like tech speak for regular TV. Like I don't turn on like channel four, basically is what I'm saying. Not because I don't want to. I just feel like there's so many options and I'm busy, but I'm sure this was on the news. But I do think it's funny that she was on the ferry. Like, and did she just go on with all of the commuters? Like, did she have to wait online? Did people push into her? And was she like, oh, excuse me, I'm... Oh, I'm a princess. <laughs> I mean, like, what, what, what was that like? You know, don't bump into the princess. Oh my god, I watched the best movie. A little bit of TV talk right now. Okay, I don't know if you people love Rebel Wilson, but I love Rebel Wilson. I love everything about her. The actress, the Australian actress. You know, she like was a heavier girl, and now she lost a bunch of weight, and she's she was great heavy. She's great thin. Like, I just love her. But there's this movie that came out called Senior Year. And I don't know, someone told me about it and I watched it. Oh my God, it's so good. You have to watch this movie. Listen, this is a feel good comedy that's gonna like just make you laugh and it's just gonna make you be like, you know what? Even though life is crazy, I this just put me in a great mood. If you like like the 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 Brat Pack movies, if you like Legally Blonde, if you like uh, This is 40, 10 Things I Hate About You, you are gonna love See if you like bring it on. Oh my God. Remember bring it on. You are going to love senior year. It's about Rebel Wilson in high school wanting to big like back in the day, like in the eighties or whatever, the nineties. And she was wanting to be prom queen. And she was like a, a nerdy girl that became popular and she wanted to be prom queen. And then she got into an accident and she was unconscious for 20 years in the hospital. And then she wakes up out of this coma. And she's still a teenager in an adult body. And she wants to be prom queen. And it's just so good. It's just so good. It's so hilarious. I loved it. Loved it. The other day, I was at a a, a, a spot downtown at Greenwich Village Comedy Club. And I was dying for chicken piccata. I know, so random. So I went next door to Monty's because it's an old Italian hole in the wall joint red sauce-ish not actually it's so red sauce-ish joint but kind of and uh the owners like there which i love because you don't when do you see owners still in the restaurants these days right like especially in manhattan anyway owner's still there old italian guy he knows me 
He knows I'm a comedian because he sees me in the clubs and uh, down on McDougal Street, by the way, and the Monty's is on McDougal. And I, I went in, I ordered the chicken piccata. And uh, here's the thing, here's the thing. It was, it was delicious. I, although it, it was, it, it was, it was a piece of chicken, right? Like a chicken breast. And then it was like, like, I, I don't know, it wasn't a leg. I think it was like a thigh also. Why don't you just do like two breasts? Or why don't you take one breast and butterfly it and give, you know, the, do the two pieces of chicken, like pound at them. What, why, why? It was, it was a little, it was white and it was a little dark. I didn't like that. The dark, I didn't like that so much, but it was delicious. But the other thing I didn't like, I, it's like, okay, here's the thing. I'm in jeans and sneaks, just jumped off stage, dying of starvation, don't want a slice of pizza, don't want my moon's falafel, although delicious also on McDougal Street. I said, I really want the chicken piccata. I go into the place. It's just me, not a fancy dinner. Well, and the waiter's coming around asking me if I want $75 of truffle shaved on the chicken. Okay, first of all, it's not, I'm not putting truffles on chicken. This is the first thing. Number two, he must've been new because um, I don't know. I didn't, there was no, there was no macaroni on the, on the table. Okay. Number three, number three, I don't ever get truffles on, on anything. I do not spend an extra $75 for a sprinkling of something just because, okay. Like even if I am at the fanciest of work dinners and I am not paying, I am not getting trouble. Like, do you do the truffle thing? Like, can't we just all stop this? Like, not every restaurant does it, but a lot. And it's like a lot of pressure. He's like, hey, would you like some truffles? It's like, no, I, I n- nope, I'm good. Really? Oh, they're delicious. For, and for, they look like little like ship walls on a plate. But it's like, no, I don't want, I don't want it. I don't want shaved truffles on my mat. And it's like on my chicken. But it's also, and then if I was on a date, like, what if I was on a date? right? What if I was on a date? How much pressure? What if you, oh my God, what if you were a guy on a date and the girl's like, yeah, I'll, I want the truffles. And that's it. An extra $75 just tacked on the bill just because somebody needed to have a little truffle flavoring on their, their angel hair pasta. I mean, really? Like, I just think it's a little, I think this is a very, this is a very aggressive sales pitch. I feel like that too, when you're at the restaurant and they come with a dessert cart, you know, they wheel it around. They don't really do that a lot of places anymore, but they used to. Remember, oh, you want dessert? You want dessert? But that's different. You're selling me a $4 German chocolate cake the size of my head. That's different than $75 truffle shavings. You know what I'm saying? Don't bother. Another thing, don't bother doing, not food related. Don't bother getting the, the, the wool trench coat, the wool gap. Oh, my skin's getting oily. I'm looking in the mirror. Don't bother getting the, the wool the wool uh, overcoat from the gap. If you would think, you know, I love the gap and I, I just, I love the gap for basics, but I got to tell you, they had this long, like past the name, black and camel color this season, you know, uh, like a wrap wool coat. And I just thought how chic, just throw it on with the jeans and the sneaks or even sweats, you know, pop the collar up. I love that. I love the look, love the look. I got it. I, I tried it on. First of all, it came like a wrinkled effing mess. Fine. I could, you know, press it. It was itchy. It was the itchy wool. It was thin. It was the itchy wool. And it's like, I put this thing on. I, I should have did a side by side. I looked like I was wearing a hefty bag. The model in the picture on Gap looks gorgeous. It looks like it's Laura Piano cashmere on the model in the picture. On me, it looked like I was something that I just got out of, I don't know, my grandfather's basement. I mean, it was so awful. Don't even waste your money. Just like literally don't waste your money. But our product of the week this week, I didn't buy, but it's in my Amazon cart, is a shoe stretch. Someone calling me? Oh, I don't know. No, it's not. That was weird. I thought it was like my doorbell. Because I told my super that my microwave had a short and he had to come up and look at it. But there's no way that he would be doing this this early. Anyway, okay. Shoe stretch spray. Okay, this this is this is this is Sally. This is a Sally seashell situation. Shoe stretch, <laughs> shoe shoe stretch spray. Okay, foot matters. Shoe stretch spray is ten dollars on Amazon, and New York Magazine said that if you have a pair of boots or a pair of shoes, leather, and they are a little too tight, you spray this spray on the shoes, and it literally stretches the shoe almost 
a half a size, like almost a full half size. I can't even believe it, but I am buying it because I have shoes that I bought on sale, probably like you, that I thought I will wear when my foot shrinks and it never did. Okay. So you basically, I have it in instructions and right in front of me. This girl, she says, you spray heavily all over the boot and the interior. You put them on and you walk around for 15 minutes, you know, and flex your feet as much as possible and all this stuff. And then you let the, the stuff dry out, the spray dry. And then you, 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 then you repeat the process, respray, wear, let dry, da-da. Literally said she has all too tight left shoes. So she's getting more to put it all on her too tight left shoes. Does this not sound? This is like a miracle product. I'm sure if you took your shoes to the shoemaker, if people are still doing that, you could say, can you stretch these shoes? And they, 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 they could do it, right? But this, this, is, this, is, this is $10 spray. This is a different, this is a different game, people. Anyway, that's all I got for you today. That's all I got. Um, I, I hope that I'm going to see some of you. I think I'm seeing some of you. Where the hell is my quote? I think I'm going to see some of you in uh, Atlantic City this past weekend. I mean, this upcoming weekend, I'm going to be uh, next weekend, I should say. The 14th and 15th, I'm going to be at the Hard Rock in Atlantic City with Vic. And I'm going to be at Bananas Comedy Club in Rutherford, New Jersey the following weekend. I'm also going to be in Long Island at the Stony Brook. The Sto- I think it's the Stony Brook Theater. I don't know. It's on my website. But I have a lot, I have a lot of good dates coming up with Vic. It's going to be great. I'm excited. And you know what? And as I've said, been saying to you, he's an absolute doll for taking me all around because <sighs> that's what we need people. We need people to bring us up. I had a quote today, by the way, as I do every week. I don't know where it is. I literally, I, I, I think my kids like saw it on a paper and ate it. I, I, this is the only thing that I could possibly imagine happened because it's TBD. All I could say to you is my own sentiment. And that's, can we stop with the family drama and appreciate the things that we do have instead of always trying to grab or reach maybe some of the things we don't have, right? And I'm not, I'm not talking about your dreams or your goals, or your aspirations, but like material things. Who fucking cares? Like literally, you cannot take this shit with you. You can't take it with you. Anyway, that's all from Elise Delucci today. Please, by the way, Give me a rating on the podcast on Apple Podcasts. Can you do me a favor? I have a lot of ratings on, a lot of reviews on Apple Podcasts, but I think I need some more because for whatever reason, a lot of them are from 2020 and 2021. I need some fresh reviews. So I'm Elise DeLucci and this is episode 117 and this is Crazy Effing Mommy and I love to love you, baby. I'm not going to